share with you. We have, uh, if you want to, you can be turning to your uh, in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter four. But I want us to welcome some new members. What is from a couple of weeks ago? Kelly Johnson. Kelly, just wait up. And Jean and Jan. Jean, there they are, right there. I was looking over there. We want to welcome them. We have, a, as I mentioned last week, these green sheets. They're at the very back of the auditorium there, uh, on the little pile on the wall. And feel free to get one and, and fill it out. You can either drop it in our offering bucket if they're by the back door, or you can give it to me. Either one. Okay, well. Oh, one thing I want to mention before we get into the message. We have some of these Bibles. Uh, I believe they're still still back there on the back table. Yeah, there they are over there where Brother Paul is. Uh, a lot of people ask me, come up, say, well, Brother Danny, what, what version of the Bible, what translation do you preach out of? Well, I preach out of... Uh, usually the New International Version. Uh, you know, back when I started preaching, there, was, you, there weren't a lot of choices. <laughs> back when I started preaching, the King James Version was about the only thing that was, that was available, and I kind of got used to that. But whenever uh, the, the New International Version came along, well, I, I liked it, and the reason I liked it is because there were no these and thous. You know, I mean, it was easy for me to understand. It was written in a language that we speak today. But you know what? There are a lot of different translations, good translations. And this is the uh, one right here, the New Living Translation. is an excellent translation of the Bible. What I'd encourage you to do is just find a good translation that you can understand. You know, I mean, the words that are used in it, you can, you can understand. And if, if you want to try one of these, well, we have some there at the back of the table. If you can afford to get you something, these are these are rather inexpensive versions because we give them away. Uh, if you'd like something a little better, well, you know what? After you take this home and read it and you like it, pass it along to somebody who doesn't have one, okay? All right. One of the, one of the issues, big issues that I have been confronted with uh, in the last few years and some, something that really is a burden on my heart, and that is the situation of families and married couples in our society today. Satan is on the attack. There is probably not an individual sitting here today that you or someone you love, someone you know, has not been under attack by Satan. And I think what we need to do is we need to take a look at what God's Word says. Because God's Word is very simple, and it, it has something to say about marriage. It has something to say about how we are to fulfill our obligation as a husband and as a wife. And the things that, that we don't probably normally... Well, just let me put it this way. They're probably not politically correct today. Okay? Okay? So get ready. You're probably going to hear some things this morning, but if you want to take it up with somebody, you're going to have to take it up with God because this is God's Word. Okay? But the first thing I'd like for us to look at, and that is the very last verse of Ephesians chapter 4. Now, the Bible was not originally broken down into chapters and verses. Okay? So sometimes, uh, and the reason it was broken down into chapters verses is just so we can find it easily. You know, I say get up here and say turn about the last two thirds of the book of Ephesians and you know that'd be a little bit difficult to find. If I say chapter 4 verse 32, well then you can find it much easier. That's the only reason it was done. But the reason I'm saying that is this. Sometimes we get the idea, you know, chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, there's a different idea altogether. That's not the case. It runs over, okay? So if you're studying the Bible, you don't necessarily want to stop at one chapter. You know, you want to read the whole thing. So the last verse of, of chapter 4 is verse 32. It says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, 
Forgiving each other just as Christ, it, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And this is bringing up that subject that I bring up time and time again. And that is the fact that as it says in Romans 5 and 8, for God so loved us. You know, God loved us so much. He demonstrated it. He demonstrated his love. He just didn't say I love you. He demonstrated it by sending his son Christ Jesus. While we were yet sinners, it says. You know what that's saying? That's saying that, 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 you know what? We have not always been lovely to look at. Is that right? Is that not right? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about physical appearance. I'm talking about our spiritual appearance before God. We're all sinners, the Bible says. And so even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the scripture. God loved us in spite of what we are and what we were. So should we not love one another in the same way? Let me read it again. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Now, it does not say be kind and compassionate to one another as long as they're nice to you. Be kind, please. As long as they have good things to say about. No, it says be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you, just as whenever we, we were ugly to God. And let's face it, sometimes people get ugly to us. But you know what? We should be kind and compassionate to them anyway. Now you say, what does that have to do with marriage? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Because marriage, if you haven't noticed, it's only because you're either one, not married, never have been married, or number two, you just got married last night. <laughs> and that may be too long. <laughs> this happily ever after business is a fairy tale. Amen. Marriage. <laughs> oh, uh, we better stop and have prayer for Don right now. <laughs> It's not going to be pretty when he gets home. <laughs> but seriously, you know, in marriage, you take two people, and most of the time in marriage, there are two people that are opposites, and you put them together, sometimes for long periods of time, 24 hours of time. I mean, you know, like on weekends, if you don't go to work, and you don't go out, you know, and do something separately, you're together a long time. And you take two people and you put them together, they don't always get along, do we? I, I was on staff at two different churches with a guy that, that led music. And he, his saying was, my wife and I never contemplated divorce. Murder, but not divorce. <laughs> and you know, that is so true. I mean, this verse fits right in, does it not? Even whenever they're not, they're not pretty, even whenever they're not lovely, even whenever they don't treat you right. As it says here, be kind and compassionate to one another. Then the first verse, you know, I told you it rolls over here, you know, and, and it, it's not a place to stop at the end of the chapter. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now you think about that. You read that over and over again. You know, as you're there fuming because your wife Change the channel on the TV. Now that's the minor thing that could go on, right? You're sitting there, ladies, fuming because your husband just came home and informed you that he was out and bought a new boat. <laughs> reason why these are funny is because we can all identify, can we not? Okay. 
What does the Bible have to say about our relationships as husband and wife? We're just talking about it right here. We should imitate God. We should imitate Christ, it says here. Okay. Now let's get in over in chapter 5, along about verse 21. Uh-huh. <laughs> Pick up your attention. Let's see if this does. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. As a husband and a wife. Or, you know, this fits with any relationship between people, but, but particularly between a husband and a wife, is that we should have, we should submit to one another. Each other. It's, it's not a 50-50 type thing, like some people would have us to believe. But we do it out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, now this is going to rub you ladies the wrong way. I can tell you right now. And, and some of you guys, you're going to be, you know, I, I can always tell whenever I preach from past scripture, you know, I've got to learn to read the audience, so to speak, because there's husbands over there just, just grinning like, you know, they, like, you know, they just, uh, just won the lottery and, and punching their wives in the side. Listen to this. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is Savior, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, before you stop listening, ladies, and guys, before you get to, you know, pounding your chest a little bit too much, you need to think about what this is saying. What this is saying is that just as God placed Jesus Christ as the head of the church, he has also placed the husband as head of the home. And as head of the home, the husband should be respected by the wife, and the husband's authority in the home should be respected by the wife. Now, guys, before you, before you get too far here, remember this. You know, with privilege comes a whole lot of responsibility. It's not, you know, it's not just talking about, you know, well, honey, uh, bring me a Coca-Cola. I'm going to rear back here in my easy chair and I'm going to watch my favorite TV show and bring me a TV dinner whenever you get done with that. That's not what it's talking about here. It's men. God has placed us to be in the family to be the leaders in the home. And that is not just talking about the physical responsibilities. Guys, listen to this. This is talking about the spiritual responsibilities in the home. God has placed us as men to be the spiritual leaders of the home. And in our society today, that seems to be a very unpopular thing. And it has been for some time. I'll share it with you. It's been about 42 years since I surrendered to the ministry. The very first church I pastored. I was going to school at Jacksonville Baptist College and and, and every day we had a uh, chapel service. And you know, us preacher boys, they'd come up and they'd ask us, they'd say, hey, uh, we got a call from a church and they want you to come and preach. Well, that, that came to me. They said, said, we got this church. They, they, they want somebody to come and preach. And, and would you go and preach this next Sunday? I said, sure. And I walked in there and there were four women and one child in that service. And I wonder, where are all the men? And guys, I think God is saying from heaven today, where are all the men? Why aren't, why aren't men taking their responsibility seriously for being the spiritual leaders in the home? Why is it that whenever the children have a question about spiritual matters, they go to mom. 
There's nothing wrong with them going to mom. But there's everything wrong whenever they think mom is the only one with the answers. What are we doing? We're teaching guys. We're teaching our young men. We're teaching our young women that being a spiritual male in churches today, in our society today, is an unmanly thing. You're a weakling if you pray. You're a weakling if you get up on Sunday morning and say, get up kids, we're going to church today. Let me ask you a very pointed question. Who's the one that rounds up everybody on Sunday morning for church? Guys? It should be us. I mean, our kids should know there's going to be a price to pay if they lay in that bed and it's not coming from mom. You see? You know what men really want, ladies? Men really want respect. From their, from their spouse. Guys, respect is something that is not just a privilege, but it's a responsibility. And it's something that we as guys have to earn. And we will take our God-given responsibilities as men seriously about being the spiritual leaders in the home. Well, you know what? That would mean bring respect from our wives. But guys and ladies, remember, in the home, in the marriage, it's the men's responsibility to be the spiritual leaders and it's the women's responsibility to submit, to show respect to their husbands. Now, I'm sure some of you ladies out there are thinking, well, you know what? My husband just does not give a flip about any of this. Well, you know what the best thing you can do? Because RJ said we're praying for an answer. The best thing you can do is pray let me tell you what, God can put a lot more pressure on you than you can. Woman's first, first uh, knee-jerk reaction is to pound, pound, pound the guys. If you were the man you should be, you'd be thus and so. Let me tell you what, God can do the job a lot better than you can, ladies. You pray for him, you do your part, and God will do his. Okay, guys? There was some seed. One, two, three verses there about the women. There's a whole bunch more that follow about guys, okay? I just want to share with you a couple of them. Listen to this. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and, and blameless. Husbands, love your wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. I bet, you know, our society today, we don't think of love as being a spiritual thing at all, do we? Christ's love for the church and the fact that he gave himself up for the church and died on the cross is a spiritual thing. It's not a sexual thing. And the love it's talking about here is a spiritual kind of love. You know what? Just as guys want respect from their, from their wives, women want love from their husbands more than anything else. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church. What does that mean, verse?
verse 28 says, In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. But you know what, guys? Yeah, I have to be honest. You know, I'm a guy, and, and, and I have to be honest. Us guys are selfish creatures. We want what we want, and we want it when we want it. And we'd a whole lot rather do things for ourselves than we would for our, our wives. But listen to this. In the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ, in the same way as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. You guys, think about that. There's a big responsibility there to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. When's the last time we as guys gave up our desires and what we wanted in order to for our wives. Maybe we need to watch that TV program, that, that girl's movie with them. Boy, I hate those things, don't you? <laughs> Chick flicks. <laughs> Maybe, you know what, we need to give up something and show our wives. I'm not just talking about that. There's many ways that we show our wives that we're alone. When's the last time you told your wife? Not just, honey, I love you. That's easy. When's the last time you told your wife, honey, you really look good tonight. Or you really look good today. You really look pretty. You really do. I mean, you know, she may be 80 years old with a face full of wrinkles. But you know what? There is beauty there. When's the last time you told her that? When's the last time you and me, and I'm talking to myself as well, when's the last time that we, as men, showed our wives in a convincing manner that we love them, that we're just not trying to say something to say it? Satan is attacking the family. If we want to be able to overcome the divorce rate that in America today is epidemic, we've got to get back to being a husband and being a wife, as God's word says. Not what's politically correct, but what God's word says. God will bless whenever we honor his word and live our lives according to that. Something we need to think about, isn't it? I want to encourage you this week to read Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, particularly chapters 5 and 6. Read there in verse 6 where it says in verse 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. It doesn't say moms bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. It says dads. It's our responsibility. Let's take these responsibilities seriously and put them into practice in our lives. And I'll tell you what. Wives... If you'll do your part, you will get a response from your husband you never dreamed of. Husband, if you do your part, you'll get a response from your wife that you never dreamed of. It will pay off. I guarantee you. That's right. Heavenly Father. Lord God, our society today is just so mixed up and messed up. Heavenly Father, we've gotten so far away from your word and living by your word. The family today is a mess. Lord, help us to bring back our families where moms respect and honor their husbands and where husbands love their wives. Help us, dear Father, to realize that that will not only pay dividends in our marriage, but also
in the marriage of our children. That our daughters will see in their daddies the kind of man that they want to marry. And our sons will see in their mothers the kind of woman to pick as a wife. I ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for